So Karen Zucker is our next speaker. Karen has been a paper conservator in private practice for 38 years. Apprentice trained, her work encompasses a full range of paper-based objects from the 15th century up to contemporary pieces. She has been responsible for many collections, including fine art, archival material, maps, historic currency, and rare books for both private hands and in, in institutions. In addition to giving workshops in the Bay Area, Karen lectures widely to the general public. And her talk today is titled, The Challenge of Paper Engineering, Conserving the Map That Changed the World, William Smith's 1815 Geological Strata of Great Britain. Um, there is big, which usually refers to size, and there is big that refers to the story. The oh, I'm sorry. That uh, and there is a big that accompanies the story that accompanies the project. This project, uh, the 1815 William Smith Geological Map of Great Britain, is one that uh, has both. And I'm going to tell you the story, but I'm just showing you a little bit of the video as a background. Um, it's not necessarily sequential, but this is part of the footage that was taken during the conservation of the map, and then I'll go more specifically into the actual treatment. So this map from 1815, uh, which originally was brought to us by Pomona College in Southern California by the geology department, and we were told the map was approximately six by eight and a half feet. And we said, mm, no problem. Um, we also knew that there, there was a book that had been written about it by Simon Winchester, an author you might know. He titles his book, The Map That Changed the World, which is a slightly exaggerated uh, title. However, the map really did change the field of geology in a very big way. And uh, when we started this map, I read the book twice um, and realized it was really an important artifact. So the story of the map is that William Smith was born in 1769. He was an Englishman who bo was born into pretty uh, diminished circumstances was very poor and did not have much of an education, actually. So as a young man, he needed a job. Uh, he was curious and imaginative, and what he could do in the countryside was become a land surveyor. And what he did as a surveyor was um, go through the countryside and look for water supplies and land drainage and the presence of coal. and. Um, work to see about the construction of canals. So this is at the very end of the 18th century. England was at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution, and uh, England was going to use coal to be transported by waterways, by canals, down to the industrial centers. So while William Smith was uh, doing his surveying and assessing, he noticed two really important things. The first was that the varied various strata or layers and deposits within the earth and the rock that he saw, um, they succeeded one another in a very definite order. And that order was repeated wherever he went. So if he was seeing whether it was limestone sandstone, shale, coal, et cetera, sand. Whatever county he went to in rural England, he saw the exact same deposition in the same order. He also observed that in these various strata, there were very definite fossils associated with the strata, and that he realized that the strata could be identified by the fossils that they contained. Now, this may not seem like a radical idea at this point, but at the time, he realized he was looking at the history of how the British Isles were formed. And that was radical in the late 18th century, because at the time, England, particularly rural England, was religious and conservative and believed that the Bible told 
the story of how the earth was formed. William Smith continued in his work uh, surveying the land and helping to dig these canals. He compiled uh, data, he made maps, and he collected fossils for over 20 years. And in 1801, he went to London and presented all of his findings along with his fossils to the London Geological Society, uh, which was at the time made up of noblemen and people of the upper classes, which uh, Smith clearly was not. He was the one who got dirt under his fingernails and they would have never done so. So they said, thank you very much, um, chose not to publish his work, and uh, he left rather impoverished at the time. Um, one of the members of the society, however, thought that there was enough value in the information that he plagiarized it and published it under his own name, and William Smith ended up in debtor's prison. It's kind of like a Charles Dickens story. But he did have a patron who uh, rescued him out of the prison. He was there for less than a year and took the information and they published William Smith's map in 1815. So, yeah, let's start it. So, um, this is the map that changed the world. <laughs> so when we first got it, I think I had mentioned we had been told it was, you know, a, you know a, not a Persian miniature, but small. And we weren't particularly concerned. But the measurement that was given to us only contained the place that had images on it. This map had been mounted as a single piece, um, mounted onto uh, a spring-loaded dowel, and it was a wall map. And it hung in the geology department at Pomona College for many, many decades. And this is what it looked like. Uh, what they didn't measure before letting us know what we were getting was that there was an extra four feet of blank paper up at the top. So even though I've already been vested by a much larger piece, um, this piece ended up being uh, 72 by a little over 144 inches in length. Uh, you're not seeing the topmost of it, but you are seeing a little bit of how it looked. The majority of it is made up of these 15 copper plate engravings. They're hand colored, mounted onto uh, linen, and then hung as a wall map. Um, it was dirty, quite, quite dirty. It had some losses. It had water stains, um, but it was incredibly beautiful. Um, now, one of the great things that William Smith was able to offer uh, the field of geology was a way of indicating how this various, these various strata could be uh, discerned on a two-dimensional surface. And he chose to use color, and he picked colors for whether for each different uh, kind of deposit. And these are the same colors that are still used by geologists today. This small uh, scale, um, I can show you, let's see, back on this map, it actually occurs right, let's see, right there. So it's fairly small and there's another version of it here. So the coloring on this map was, of course, incredibly important for us to keep. Uh, and here it shows, um, he actually put little place names to indicate elevation, and then the colors indicate what he actually found in his digging. So this is a real quick view of parts of my studio. It looks very calm and empty, and nothing much is going on. Uh, this is before the map arrived. Uh, this is the front. Just to give you an idea, this is the crew. We realized early on we're, we were going to need a lot of people because we were going to do a fair amount of treatment on this piece and we were going to need to turn it over multiple times. Uh, here we are doing some of the initial unrolling. We figured out right away it was not going to fit on our table. So we brought another table down to accommodate those extra almost four feet of blank paper. We did at some point remove them to treat them and then of course uh, return them to the map itself because they were going to be part of it. Um, there was a, a lot of damage, 
not all of it immediately discernible because the cloth backing uh, hid a lot of it. There were pieces missing. There were uh, interesting deposits on the surface. There were also areas of silking on the front for those of you who don't know. It's the application of a very fine silk mesh that um, is relatively translucent that's used to mend things from the front. Um, I'm here showing um, one of our friends the book, The Map That Changed the World, and I do recommend it. It's a really fun read by Mr. Winchester. We, we also thought right from the get-go that the project was too big and too important to not document it in some way other than just with our usual digital images. So a friend of mine who's a filmmaker helped uh, me hire a student film crew, and uh, that was the director. This is our still photographer. That's our videographer. And we tried to sync with them on the days that we were actually doing the treatment so that they would be there uh, when they weren't going to school. That didn't always pan out, so there are large parts of the video footage that we have that really did not get documented. Um, but here we are just starting to unroll it to see what we had. Luckily, these pictures were taken from a catwalk that we have in the studio. You'll maybe see it in another uh, slide where we have two stories and there's a catwalk that goes, that gives you access to the second floor. And we were able to put a camera up there and then have the map on that big table, which is on rollers, just very gently be moved. Each individual engraving was photographed separately, and both before and after treatment, and then stitched together in Photoshop. Was, was there a question? Oh, OK. So um, uh, it was uh, interesting in that this map has <coughs> appeared both mounted as a single piece such as this one is, and uh, more often in individual sheets. So there are a few portfolios that exist that uh, the sheets have not been put together, but this one clearly was done sometime very much around the time it was published in 1815. Uh, the bottom edge uh, was attached to a dowel in more ways than I can tell you. Uh, they had a, a wooden dowel that they routed out um, a portion of it that was square in uh, cross section. They then stuffed the bottom of the map into that, reinserted the wood with glue and nails, and then a patch on top. It, it took us four hours just to remove this bottom dowel, and we were really concerned with doing so because we could see that there was a little bit of printing along the bottom that said, published by John Carey, August 1st, 1815. That information appeared other places in the map, but we were still, you know, we're conservators. We save everything. So we were determined to get that itty bitty piece back. Um, here we are again trying to, we're still looking at the front of it, trying to figure out how much damage and how much, uh, how much damage there was and how much replacement there would be. Now I should mention that the geology department wanted this done with all, all of a sudden newfound interest because the 200th anniversary of the map was coming up in 2015 and there was a conference in London for this map and for five minutes. Okay, so here we are. Uh, this is my, my colleague, Laura Muller, who's in the, in the audience who can attest to some of this. This is the spring-loaded dowel at the top that was filled with lead and weighed about 25 pounds, which we did remove. We removed those three <coughs> sheets that are stained but virtually blank. We did treat them and reattach them and eventually there was a table under that edge. So everything we did to the map was fairly straightforward. Surface cleaning, removal of the backing, uh, removal or reduction of the adhesive on the back, which was a starch paste, 
um, removal of all old men's and patches, which we were not aware of how, how many there were. And in fact, once we got to the back of the map and removed that backing, we were set back by at least three days because there were so many repairs that had not been discernible from the front. Um, this is just to show you how incredibly fine the printing is. It's, it's an exquisite map, just incredibly beautiful. And the coloring is beautiful too. We tested the solubility, of course, of all the colors. The kind of deep auburn and the turquoise were a little problematic, but we knew we were gonna do some wet cleaning on it anyway. And the big issue was twofold. What supports do we use that would accommodate something this big? And how do we get to the middle? So the supports ended up being uh, three sheets of clear polyester, Melanex, that were 60 by 80 inches each. And we joined them together with JLAR, that clear uh, pressure sensitive tape that's very thin and non-reactive in water to make not one but two supports that were each uh, hmm, 80 by 120 inches. So one for the top and one for the bottom. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out now that we had a, uh, a method, we had something to turn it over with, how were we gonna do it within our space? So we actually choreographed it quite a few times. We experimented with how many people would we need once we had the map ensconced between the mylar, where would we stand? Uh, so we did run-throughs with empty mylar. <laughs> um, but you can see we actually had to have two people on um, uh, ladders, and I think it's coming up. So there's Laura on, on the left and myself on the right, and there actually are two more people uh, here, a pair of hands, here's a set of hands, <laughs> and this is us. Now this is, towards the end, we've actually done, done the blotter washing, so these are not in exact sequence either, but we had to take them out, drop it off the edge of the table, then pull it up and move it back. So we, um, like dancers, we put blue tape markers on the floor to tell people where to actually stand so we could do the flip. And we did the flip, I think, six times altogether. Never got easier. Here we're um, putting it back on the table between the mylar, trying to flatten it out for blotter washing, this gives you some idea of some of the losses that we had, and blotter washing. And here's where it gets interesting. How do we get to the middle of the map? I wasn't about to build a Japanese moon bridge across the <laughs> studio. So one night, uh, out of desperation, I went to Home Depot and I showed them the picture and I said, this is, I need to do this. And they said, oh, um, we have a telescoping platform, and it's an aluminum platform, I guess used by painters and plasterers. It's about 14 inches wide. It's um, eight feet in length, but the ends telescope out to make it 12 feet. So maybe I'll go back for a second. You can see uh, way over to the left, half of it is just resting on an existing mat board cabinet, and you'll see in a minute uh, the other side is just re resting on a ladder. So um, the gentleman in the orange shirt is the head of Pomona College's geology department. Um, he flew up for a day to see what we were doing. I think he was totally mystified. He had never seen conservation before. Um, and while he was in the studio, of course we stuck him in a corner upstairs, um, he would email his geology colleagues in England saying, this is the map we have, what do you have? What can you tell me about this? And they went back and forth the whole time and we got a lot of information about other editions of the map. And they think there are about, well, maybe this is number 36. I think it's about 36. And all of these are signed, I might add. They were signed by William Smith and he had a, his own numbering system. So this is A6. Uh, so here am I, I very ungracefully went out on the ladder. I'm the smallest person in the studio, so I uh, put down um, 
knee pads that I got from the garden shop at Home Depot and skittered out and did my blotter washing in the middle. The strange thing about this was we felt so great that we found a way to reach the middle. But when we were through using it, we didn't know what to do with this platform, which was long and incredibly heavy. Here's our uh, geology professor going, what are they doing? Um, so uh, someone on the staff said, well, you could return it. And, and I, who had never so much as returned a meal in a restaurant, went, I, I can. So um, somebody helped me when we were through with the project, helped me take the ladder back in my car, and I went to Home Depot, with, and I just said, I'd like to return this. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't say anything. And they said, OK. And they gave me my $200 back, and I walked out going, I love America. I can't believe it. I was so excited. So um, one of the big issues was what would be the best way to treat the map? Do we take it apart? And we, we realized we, we never wanted to take it into individual sections because we'd never get the alignment back properly. But there were a lot of areas where old adhesive on the overlaps were, was quite discolored. So um, when this was fully wetted out, we did lift it up. We helped realign tears that were within the map, and we put new paste down. Uh, then we used a traditional wheat starch paste. We used uh, Hiromi roll-type paper, Sakashu Extra Thick, to line it with. And then we actually stretch-dried it to the table. It, initially, it went under felts. And you can see some of the losses here. We did have some pieces which we placed back in. Um, we also manufactured some replacements. And I, th I think there was one slide that I missed. Um, one thing we were really interested in finding out was, and maybe it was in the video, was there a watermark on this paper? And uh, just from experience, it really felt to me like Jay Wattman paper, meaning it was a pain to deal with. And it wasn't until um, halfway through that we found the only existing watermark in any of the uh, 18 sheets. And it was on the key, the title one that is way in the top front. Well, this is us after, looking a little dazed. This was weeks later, I might add. But um, this, the key here that was always more discolored, that was the only panel that actually had a watermark. We did find it with a light sheet, and it said J. Wantman, 1815. So we felt great. Now, the color is slightly off, but you have to realize just the scale of trying to do this. Uh, this is obviously the before and after. Um, it was an enormous project. It really needed a project manager. I guess I ended up being that person. Um, after we were finished with it, we had an archival tube manufactured to go within an archival box because it was going back to Pomona. This is the compass on it. And it does reside there. And I'll just say that um, a few months after it was shipped back to Pomona, Simon Winchester came to the college and gave a talk about it. And they brought out the map and showed it. And it was quite wonderful. So thank you. Uh, just maybe a quick question for Karen. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. I'm wondering how it went back. Oh, sorry. Oh, I can say this again. It's really great, Karen. I love the video footage. It was mesmerizing in Even the beginning. Even though it's all out of order. It didn't matter. It was cool. Thank you. Um, but I wondered what its final um, format was? Did you put it in a frame or back in the spring-loaded thing? Or no, what did you they do? didn't want the, the dowels reconnected. The bottom one uh, really did obscure. Everything was sent back to them, including the rusty little nails um, and the incredibly heavy top. But it, they wanted to be able to show it, but not all the time. They weren't going to rehang it. So mm -hmm. the way they have it now it, it's on this very large archival tube in its beautiful, incredibly expensive box. And uh, when they want to show it, they unroll it. Mm -hmm. The one issue was, usually when we roll something around a tube, we roll it with the image side out so it's not collapsing on itself. 
but we knew if we did that with this piece, when they took it out and unrolled it, it'd be upside down. And then they'd have to find six people to turn it over, and they wouldn't be conservators. So without sounding too much, we, we decided to roll it with the image side in, so when it was opened up, it would be flat. And I did see it um, for Mr. Winchester's talk. I went down to Pomona, and the, they had a special room with two guards, and um, they unrolled it, and it was, I was so glad it was flat. It looked great. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I missed it in the film, but I didn't hear you mention it in your talk. It, I'm inferring that you took the canvas off, the oh, original we did. linen. Yes. And yep. what, what dictated your final decision to line it on a paper as opposed to putting it back on a woven fabric? Well, because they're really not that compatible to begin with. The original linen was four lengths of hand woven linen that was pretty dirty and deteriorated. It was actually really stained and was no longer. Well, I didn't mean to suggest you put it back on oh. the same linen. Oh, just a new linen? Yeah. Never occurred to us. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have done that. The paper was, was lighter weight, much more compatible, offered more options for hanging or framing at some point. Um, we don't usually line paper with something other than paper. because they're... Worked for years. I know, I know. <laughs> but one of them, I mean, we just did something where a, a completely different project, a contemporary one, where we used um, a canvas, and when you get it wet, it shrinks. When paper gets damp, it expands. If you have them going in opposite directions, neither of them are dimensionally stable. Uh, the, the cloth is going to win because it's stronger. And these were all pretty brittle. So we thought all it needed was a little bit of support from the back to help keep it intact as one piece. And the Japanese paper really conforms beautifully to the map and is flexible along with it. We'll talk later if you <laughs> don't believe me. Okay. Uh, no, just a quick question. Oh. Um, why the extra four feet of blank paper at the top? That was what wrapped around the dowel, wrapped around the spring-loaded dowel. That was all wrapped up the in spring? there. That was how it was issued. And so they, we, we were, of course, we're going to return it the same way. Uh, it was much cleaner by the time we finished with it than the rest of the map, but we thought that was okay. And it was much more alkalized than the rest of the map. But they when we rolled it up, that's what initially went on the tube as well. So it was a protective measure. And it was original. 